the awkward beforehand where <laughs> like when you're teaching right like you're waiting for the yeah. students to kind of trickle in you don't know what to do so you just stand there and wait and stuff <laughs> like that. So. i i play music in the background and pretend they're not just popping in and so <clears> that's, <throat> like, yeah. that's an option you have now with zoom i suppose yeah <laughs> what kind of music do you play varsha uh, so I started off playing like music that like fit the class. So like if I was teaching mm. American history, I would play like, you know, John Brown's body or like a bunch of Pete Seeger songs. But now I just play like my, my shuffle playlist. So like it alternates between like Taylor Swift and like just like random stuff. And so then sometimes in the chat, uh, students would be like, I love that song. And I'm like, oh, good. I'm like, I'm still cool with the youth. So. <laughs> <laughs> um. I have a, a teenager and um, every once like we'll put on like a playlist or something like that. And sometimes it'll just be like kind of shuffling and every once in a while he'll come to me like, why are you listening to that? That's my music. Like you can't do that. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm always incredibly proud because the other time he'll say like, what the hell is this? What, what are you guys listening to? This doesn't make any sense to me. So like now if you're listening to like Lil Nas X and like it's Montero playing, he's like, no, you cannot listen to that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> My music. <laughs> so. All right. Bill, um, are you I, in San Francisco or in LA now? I'm in Los Angeles today. Okay. Does it vary by by day? Do you move back it and does, forth? It does. It does. I, I live in San Francisco um, most of the time. My family's there, uh, but my job is in LA, so I tend to go back and forth. Oh, okay. That makes sense. So I've done that that I five drive uh, many times, and the, the the quick Southwest flight. You know, when I was at uh, when I was at Berkeley, but uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I've done it. I was doing it. I was commuting almost on a weekly basis before the pandemic, and obviously that slowed down. I don't need to be in the office practically uh, ever anymore. Um, although now we're going to be getting back into the office in July or so, um, and so I'm I'm down here more to sort of start planning for that. Yeah. Yeah, that's a big transition that uh, like our university is talking about right now is, is moving back into on fully on campus operations. So um, in fact, I got a memo about it today, which I have to read later on and figure out what, what's going on. So it should be fun. Anyway, well, should we should we get going? Yeah, we'll get going. And so like the, the first thing I want to say is all three of us. Uh, so besides Rachel and I just wanted to introduce Rachel. Rachel is going to be handling everything for the Q and A and in the background. So anybody who's watching, make sure to put in your questions. You know, as soon as you get them, and have have like a lot of questions for Nils. Uh, and then uh, before I introduce Nils, I just want to say all three of us, me, Matt, and Nils are all bears. We are golden bears. We all are Cal grads. So this is going to be really fun. Um, so if people don't know, uh, Dr. Nils Gilman is the Vice President of Programs at the Brogan Institute. Um, so he leads the Institute's research program. He works on the fellowship program. Uh, he's also the deputy uh, editor of the Noema Magazine and previously has worked as an associate chancellor at UC Berkeley, right? And that's where I met him. He was one of my uh, professors in my last year of college. And he is the reason that I am in the uh, I do the topic that I do. I work on modernization theory and dams as well. Uh, and so he is the author of Mandarins of the Future, uh, Modernization Theory in the Cold War in Cold War America. And he's the co-editor of Deviant Globalization, Black Market Economy in the 21st Century. Uh, and he's written a bunch of other things that, you know, make us really sad for the fact that we don't publish as much. So, Nils, the first question I have is what uh, what are you drinking with us today? Today I'm drinking Red Breast, uh, Irish whiskey. Nice. Very nice. Matt, so, you are you a, are you an Irish? Well, a, a question for Nils actually yeah. a follow up, if I may, right now. It's more of a comment than a question. So, <laughs> um, um, like, are you an Irish whiskey aficionado, or do you? Is that just like that's the one that you you kind of go to? Well, in all candor, I'm uh, right now. I'm at my dad's house, and this is what he has. <laughs> <laughs> We have all been there, so I understand a hundred percent. Like this is what's here. This is what I'm drinking. So, that's right. Yeah, I know. If I'm at my dad's house, I have to sneak Jack Daniels. Like that's what I have to drink. <laughs> or, and, yeah, it's it's yeah. what it is. So anyway, yeah. um, Rachel, what what are you drinking with us? I'm drinking um, a craft hard seltzer by Two Robbers. I don't know if you can see it because it's very. It's very Larry. reflecty. Yes. Yeah. Is that a local? Um, what do you call people who make hard seltzer? Brewer, bathtub distiller, something like that? <laughs> I think it in their attic. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. 
it's very tasty and it's only a hundred calories and it's 5% alcohol. Oh, so, you know, it's not like a lime or Rita or anything by not to like, <laughs> to denigrate anyone well, who wants to drink those, but you know. We, we welcome all drinkers uh, on drinking with historians, so. <laughs> we have to have yes. our pinky out when we drink on drinking. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's right yeah we're, we're we're fancy people so um that's fantastic all right thank you rachel so we'll see you later um i'm drinking i i did i i tweeted a meme so i felt like i had to do this um i am drinking a fancy cocktail um today and it's called a bijou um i was not that i'm ever tired of whiskey because i never get tired of whiskey but i wanted to do something a little bit different. so it's a gin based drink it has a uh, gin, sweet vermouth, and some green chartreuse, and a little bit of orange bitters, and it's just, it's mixed up. Apparently, it's like one of the kind of original cocktails from um, Harry's American Bar in Paris in the 1920s. Um, and there's a whole story, which, of course, instead of doing work, I was looking up drinks during the day and figuring out and read about and stuff like that. And I can tell everybody else, but it's it's very delicious and it's very refreshing because it's it's strangely um, it's strangely warm here after it snowed here two days ago because that's Virginia weather. So here we are anyway. So cheers everyone and welcome to another episode of Drinking with Historians. So yeah. um, I, if it's okay, like I have the first question. Go, no, go for it. I'm gonna go for it. So, so Nils, um, you know, you work on, um, you know, a variety of things that you have, a, you know, a raft of publications. One of the things that Varsha, when we were talking about kind of who we needed to have, and she was saying, we need to have Nils Gilman, we need to have Nils Gilman on here. <laughs> we're talking about this thing called mon modernization theory. And now I am a simple medievalist who doesn't under, like, this is pre-modern, right? So we don't deal with <laughs> theory. So can you talk to us a little bit, like, what is modernization theory? Like, how does your work kind of engage with yeah, so I, uh, my dissertation at Berkeley and that turned into my first book was an intellectual history of modernization theory. And modernization theory was, uh, the way I got into it um, was I was interested in uh, US development policy during the Cold War um, and specifically thinking, well, more broadly about US policy towards the post-colonial world and thinking about how to manage the process of decolonization in the context of the Cold War. Um, and as I got into that uh, subject, I realized that modernization theory, or what retrospectively, uh, starting in the 1970s and 80s, started to be called modernization theory, was really the kind of dominant social science paradigm for interpreting what was going on in these uh, post-colonial countries. Well, the basic thesis of modernization theory, uh, in its sort of simple, simplified form, was that all countries go through a linear process of development. They start out as traditional. The kind of stuff people you study, Matt, are traditional people. So are the peasants in China. So are the indigenous peoples of uh, the entire world. All these people are lumped into one category that is called traditional society. And the idea is traditional society is static, it's superstitious, uh, it's uh, you know, based on a scriptive social status. Uh, there's a whole bunch of uh, what are known uh, following Talcott Parsons, the Harvard sociologist, as pattern variables where people have a certain set of uh, kind of cognitive, psychological, and social characteristics that are uh, present in traditional societies and in all traditional societies. And then the process of modernization is a transition from that set of traditional values to a modern mindset and a modern country. Um, and the idea is that we can not only trace that some countries have gone through that, but by identifying those patterns, it was hoped during the Cold War that development would be able to accelerate countries through that process and specifically help them avoid what the dominant theorists of that era, uh, Walt Whitman Rostow, called the disease of the transition, which is the temptation to instead of going through this process that leads you to a happy capitalist modernity, you get diverted off into the perverted form of, mod of modern modernity, namely state socialism. So modernization theory basically limbed both a meta-historical process that all countries naturally went through, as well as providing a prescriptive set of uh, policy proposals for how to accelerate that process so that the uh, revolution of rising expectations, that was the term that was used at the time, would be met by a rapid process of development that would allow states to be built into modern states. So you mentioned Walt Whitman Rostow, and I remember back when I when I teach a class, you have a couple of fun stories about Walt Whitman Rostow. What what was the major role that he played in this whole saga of modernization theory? Uh, 
so Rostow is an interesting figure because when I first got into modernization theory, I thought what I was going to be doing was telling a story about economic development. Um, and that's partly because Walt Whitman Rostow was himself an economist, and he's the person who's most closely associated with modernization theory. He wrote a book in 1961 called The Stages of Economic Growth, um, the subtitle of which was A Non-Communist Manifesto. So that sort of tells you right <laughs> there that it's a program <laughs> It's a programmatic Cold War text, right? Um, and it turns out that Rostow is actually a little bit of an outlier um, in the firmament of modernization theory, because actually most modernization theorists were not economists. They were political scientists and sociologists. They were actually critiquing, in some ways, the, what they saw as the simple-minded econo econometric, econometric view of development, which said that this was a purely economic process and said, actually, there are all these other social and political, what we now call institutions, that are really important to get right if you want to get through this process of economic modern economic development. So modernization theory was really the political science and sociology analog and supplement to the story of economic development. Now Rostow himself was a really interesting guy. Um, he was a brilliant young man. He grew up uh, in a uh, in a in a lower middle class uh, Jewish family in New Haven, Connecticut, graduated from high school when he was 16, went to Yale, got a full ride to Yale, um, and, uh, you know, and, then, uh, and then went on to get a PhD um, uh, at a very young age in economics. After the war, so during the war, during the Second World War, um, when he was born in 1916, graduates from Yale, I think in uh, 1939, I believe. Um, or even earlier than that, perhaps. Um, and, uh, and then during the war, he worked for the Strategic Bombing Survey, uh, trying to figure out what was, uh, you know, the effectiveness of the, you know, the systematic carpet bombing of, uh, he was working on Europe, um, you know, trying to identify what were the proper targets for that. After the war, he went to go work for Gunnar Myrdal at the Council, uh, for the, uh, at the Council of Europe, um, and was helping Gunnar Myrdal, who, of course, was a very important development economist, um, think about the reconstruction of Europe. And then after the war, he came back and got a job um, first, at, uh, first at Cambridge uh, in, in, in Britain, and then at MIT, which is where he spent the next uh, 10 years of his career at, at MIT. Um, and during the 1950s, which is when he was at MIT, um, he ended up uh, becoming an advisor to a lot of uh, Dem Democrats and specifically became an advisor uh, to uh, John F. Kennedy, they were both Cambridge, Massachusetts people. He met literally in a garden party, I believe, in Cambridge in the summer of 1958, uh, met Kennedy at a party, and then became an informal advisor to the Kennedy campaign. And as a result, once Kennedy was elected in 1960, he became um, the, uh, uh, the director for policy planning at the State Department initially, um, and then went on to become what uh, was the uh, national security advisor under Lyndon Johnson. He ended up becoming the senior most person in the government to serve continuously from 1961 to 1969 in the uh, in the Kennedy and Johnson administrations on the foreign policy side. So he, you know, he was a big player uh, in all of this. Um, in 1969, when uh, Lyndon Johnson left office, uh, Rostow had become extremely controversial because he was a, he was a very hardline uh, cult, um, Vietnam hawk, oh, yeah. um, and uh, you know was as the national security advisor, obviously intimately involved in the strategy. Uh, in Vietnam in the late 1960s, in the late 1960s, in the late stages of uh, of, uh, of of Lyndon Johnson's uh, administration, and as a result, he wasn't welcomed back um, to MIT. He was not offered to go back to MIT in 1969, and instead, he followed Lyndon Johnson back to Texas and spent the last uh, 30 years of his career uh, at the University of Texas uh, at the Lyndon Johnson um, Library, where he had a sinecure and he wrote. Many, many, many more books. I mean, uh, you know, Rostow was famous for being unbelievably prolific. I mean, he would just churn out memos and books. He, had, you know, he wrote something like thirty-five books, hundreds and hundreds of articles. But then, in addition to that, if you go to the archives at the State Department, you know, one huge long memo after another. I mean, the guy just churned out text. Um, and this gets to you know one of the funny stories I have um, that I've shared with Varsha before in class. So I was writing my dissertation in the late nineteen nineties. And I knew, you know, I went, and at that point, many of the old former modernization theorists, people like Lucien Pye and Walt Rostow and Gabriel Almond, they were all Neil Smelser. These guys were all still alive, Clifford Geertz. And I had a chance to go interview uh, many of them. Um, 
And I went to go visit uh, Walt Ross down in Texas um, in April uh, 1999. And the way I'd prepared for that interview was I had tried to read as many of his you know, writings as possible. And as I say, like just even trying to read everything he wrote. I mean, it was hard to read everything he wrote, let alone trying to imagine having written everything he wrote. Um, and the way I prepared strategically for that um, interview was that I wanted to see if he'd changed his mind about things because, you know, he was a controversial figure, you know, associated with the disaster in Vietnam and, you know, modernization theory had been largely repudiated by the 1990s, at least on a theoretical level. And so I basically went and sort of said, look, I, I went and found things that I thought that he'd written in the 40s or 50s or 60s that were, to my mind, like outrageously wrongheaded by the 1990s. <laughs> and I sort of started asking him questions about that. And I'd say, well, you know, you wrote X in 1947 or 1954 or whatever, what do you make of that statement now? Or, or, or sometimes I would try to ask him a question where I knew he, what the answer was that he had made in 1954. I tried to pose a question to see if he'd give me a different answer in order to see whether you know, there'd been an evolution in his thinking. And it was the weirdest interview I've ever done to this day because <laughs> he didn't know what questions I was gonna ask him. Um, but the answers he gave me were literally almost verbatim quotes from the things he had written 30, 40, 50 years earlier, wow. right? Now, I only had an hour with the guy and you know, I'm a half an hour in, I've asked him like seven questions and he's basically given me the verbatim same answer that, um, uh, you know, that he'd written earlier. And I realized I'm not getting anything out of this interview. This is not very useful other than realizing the man hasn't changed his mind about anything <laughs> in his entire life, right? Um, which is extraordinary, right? If you think about it. I mean, in fact, there's, a, there's an essay he wrote in 1984, I believe it was, uh, reflecting back on his life. And he actually says, I had it all figured out when I was 16. I've just been like working out the <laughs> <laughs> he, 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 he printed this in 1984. Yeah. Um, so I, at this point, I realized I wasn't getting anything out of the interview. I sort of tossed my notes aside and I said, well, look, Dr. Rostow, you know, obviously, you know, you seem to like stuck, stuck to your position on a lot of the things that you thought about a long time ago. So I just want to understand a different question. You know, you spent the first half of your career from the, you know, 40s, 50s and 60s in, in really prominent position in public life, you know, working on things during the war and then as an advisor uh, to high levels of government in the 50s and, you know, actually one of the most powerful people in government during the 1960s. And then since then, you've been back here in Texas and you know, you've had a really you know, prolific career as a scholar, but you haven't been really in corridors of power or engaged in the policy process at all. What's that been like for you as a transition you know, from first half of your career to second half of your career? And he says, oh, no, 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 that's not true that I haven't been involved in, 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 in policy issues. So this was news to me, I didn't know. I, I'm like, oh, really, what, what, what have you been up to? He says, well, Elspeth and I, that's his wife, Elspeth and I have been doing a lot of work uh, in, in the uh, in the East Austin slums, and he sort of, or, sorry, he says ghetto, the East Austin ghetto, and he gesticulates, you know, out out the window. Now, now I have to set the scene for you. It's early April in, in in Central Texas, and it's already 100 degrees, and you know Texas is pretty flat, and it's like literally the Texas plane is shimmering out the window of his you know tenth <laughs> floor uh, office building. I'm sort of, he's at his desk in front of me and I'm looking out the window as he gestures out towards the ghetto out in the distance. And I said, whoa, that seems like a really kind of different project you had there. He says, no, 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 no. I see it as a direct continuation of the stuff I was doing in the White House. Oh my God. <laughs> now, at this point, I really started to have like kind of a, a vertigo effect. I'm like, what? <laughs> and I literally had this kind of hallucination of seeing the B-52s coming in carpet bombing the East Austin ghetto. And I was like, that's kind of weird that he thought that. But you know what? I realized, and, and I was a greenhorn back then. You know, I was 26 years old or however old I was when I was doing this interview. I've, done, I've got a lot more experience now. And actually this interview taught me a lot about interviewing, which is when somebody gives you an answer that makes no sense, you should say, say more, right? <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> right? Um, but I didn't, I didn't have the wherewithal to realize this. And this was, you know, it was five minutes before the end of the hour. And so I was just sort of like, oh, wow, that's crazy. But it turned out this was the crucial, this provided me with the crucial insight that went into the book, the dissertation in the book, which is that in fact, the project of modernization abroad in the minds of the modernization theorists, at least in the mind of Rostow, was intimately connected to the project of modernization at home. And that's because the, the way they conceived of poverty is that poverty was essentially a form of backwardness, of traditional society that was unreformed, right? And so the process that liberal governments wanted to go through 
was to help these backward people go through a process of modernization so they could become healthy modern people, right? And that was true whether you're talking about people in the quote ghetto of East Austin or you're talking about Vietnamese peasants. And of course, the first order of business was to try to provide them with carrots in the form of economic development incentives um, or great society programs, right? Or if that didn't work, then you had to have punitive policing or you know, counterinsurgency mechanisms, right? So if you think about what happens in the 1960s, you have a similar process domestically as you do at home. And here I wanna cite a work that has really extended this thesis, I think beautifully, Stuart Schrader's book, Badges Without Borders, which has really like done a great job of showing the way the punitive side of it uh, mm -hmm. was also translated back and forth between the domestic and the international sphere. So the kinds of counterinsurgency mechanisms that were pioneered in the abroad were then brought home to deal with the so-called insurgency of unruly uh, subjects back home in impoverished communities back home. So this actually nowadays is I think pretty well understood as the connections between these things both at home and abroad. But that kind of connection between the home and the abroad was not the way in which things were understood in the late 1990s historiography. At that time, the dominant narrative liberal mostly narrative, but also the left narrative about the Lyndon Johnson administration is that it was a tragedy, that the great project at home of trying to do social reform was undermined by you know, the horrible things that were done in Vietnam. In fact, what I realized reflecting on Rostow's comment to me is that the two projects of you know, the great society at home and the Vietnam war abroad were one project. It seems like, I mean, you know, again, like this is this is really interesting, and, and I don't know a whole lot about modernization theory at all. And by not knowing a whole lot, I mean like nothing. But like, it seems like race is intimately involved in this conceptualization, right? So, and you know, that that's so interesting that um, the the distinction between the foreign policy and the domestic was 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 kind of severed, and, and, and it needs to be brought back together as see as a coherent policy, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, race is race is a really important part of this, and and Rostow himself is a, is a classic racial liberal um, in, in, in the 1950s dispensation, as was Lyndon Johnson, right? I mean, Lyndon Johnson's, yeah. you know, to this day, I think most people would agree his most important achievement was the, was the Voting Rights Act, right? Um, and, uh, you know, and he recognized that he was, as he famously said, signing away the South for the Democratic Party for a generation, and he totally underestimated it. Um, but, you know, Rostow actually, in the 1950s, uh, one of the projects he engaged in as part of his Energizer Bunny activities was to help design one of the pavilions at the 1958 World's Fair in Brussels. Um, and the pavilion that he designed um, was specifically about racial justice. So you'll remember that in 1957, oh. in 1957, that had been the Little Rock, the Little Rock episode. So in 1954, we have Brown versus Board of Education. 1957, there's the Little Rock, you know, forcible desegregation effort imposed by the National Guard. You know, uh, you know, while Eisenhower had been a little bit lukewarm on this, he believed in enforcing Supreme Court doctrine. And so he sent in the National Guard to enforce the, uh, uh, and you know, this created huge headlines all around the world. It was definitely negative Cold War propaganda for the United States. The Soviet Union was making hay out of this. Um, you know, it was just on the cusp of massive uh, decolonization in Africa. So this was a sort of a bad episode. So the Rostow responded by helping to design a pavilion where he described what was going on in the United States with racial justice as a delayed form of modernization, that these racial prejudices that uh, were you know, of long standing in the United States were finally being overcome by the domestic process of modernization, right? And that you know, the, the, this was the, the, the birth pangs of a new modern, uh, liberal order that was no longer going to be beset by the kind of traditional prejudices, again, traditional versus modern, right? Traditional prejudices of race and so on. So they put together this pavilion uh, that actually went live for a week in 1958 in Brussels. And there were all these segregationist senators who found out that this thing had been put together who became ad absolutely apoplectically angry, right? So you had uh, Theodore Bilbo from Georgia, one of the most notorious segregationist senators, and several others who demanded that the US take down this exhibit. Because of course, they were being represented as a backward element of the United States that was in the process of being eradicated by modernization. 
needless to say, that was not their own self-conception. Um, so, you know, so absolutely race was tied up in the whole conception of modernization theory, but it was moving towards the idea that we should be moving towards a post-racial society and that the modern society would be one that no longer had ascribed social status on the basis of race. Yeah. So I have two questions. The first question is, so you were talking to, you know, Ross Dow in, in the late 90s or, you know, like 1999, you said, and obviously the Cold War by this time has ended. Um, so my, my first question is, what happens after the Cold War ends? And, and as you said, modernization theory is largely theoretically, you know, thrown aside. Is it really thrown aside or like what actually happens with it? And then my second question is, oh, what is the role that think tanks play in all of this? Because you work at a think tank now. Right. Um, so, you know, modernization theory is one of these things that was sort of theoretically repudiated, but has never really gone away, right? Um, Doesn't die. I refer, to, I refer to it as zombie theory, right? What is a zombie? A zombie is something that's dead, but still walking around and eating the brains of the living to sustain <laughs> it. Um, and modernization theory is that way. I, I published a piece a couple of years ago um, in the Journal of Political Economy, um, the Journal of the History of Political Economy, um, wh which I you know, referred to as why modernization theory never dies. Um, and the reason why modernization theory never dies is because it embodies a beautiful liberal technocratic dream that these elites, the so-called mandarins of the future that my book is named after, are going to be able to you know, move a backward society into a beautiful modern world. Right? And they're going to be able to overcome all of the old you know, restraints and constraints and pains that the traditional world represented. And through a technocratic process of liberal elites doing their thing, be able to create a better world. Well, that narrative, that meta narrative is obviously very attractive to a certain kind of technocratic elite. And so there's a way in which that thing never went away. Now it stopped being explicitly articulated, um, but it's kept being held onto. And think tanks were an important part of that, right? Because they continue to promote policies that as liberal technocratic elites conformed to the idea of modernization theory, even though nobody was really defending it as a theoretical proposition anymore. And so I'll just give you one example. Like, you know, I have to say, when I wrote my dissertation, I wrote my book, I thought I was writing for an audience of, you know, 15 other people who are interested in the history of history of <laughs> Um, Little did you know I would read it. <laughs> well, not only that, like it has, it has almost 1,500 citations on Google Scholar now, which is at least one, but probably two orders of magnitude more than I ever expected I would get. <laughs> um, and the reason for that is something that has nothing to do with the quality of the book. Um, the reason for that, I think, is that you know I I, I finished I turned in the manuscript in uh, in the fall. You know I initially submitted the manuscript to Johns Hopkins University Press. Um, in uh, the summer of 2001, before 9-11. Um, I, I went through a series of revisions. Um, and, uh, and then in the summer of 2002, just as I was finishing it up, um, the United States, but 9-11 had happened. We'd invaded, Afga we'd invaded Afghanistan. And in two, the August 2002, the United States published, uh, or this, you know, the, the government, the federal government published the National Security Strategy, which I think was written mainly by Condoleezza Rice. And I, I remember downloading it um, and just being stunned as I read it because it was absolutely warmed over modernization theory. We're going to invade the Middle East and you know, we're gonna be greeted as liberators because we're a modernizing force that represents eternal values. Um, and we're gonna be able to transform the Middle East and take them from being backward people who wanna kill each other over their ancient enmities and transform them into modern nation states that support liberal democracy, which is what Americans believe in. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm caricaturing that only a slightly little bit. I mean, you should go back and read <laughs> 2002 no. National Security Strategy is a document that anybody who's interested in American foreign affairs absolutely should read. Um, and I was, I mean, I, I, I couldn't believe what I was reading. Now, in retrospect, it's not surprising. Condoleezza Rice got her PhD from the University of Denver in 1975, which is right at the apex of late modernization theorists, late modernization theory sort of high watermark in the political science profession. And then she hadn't been an academic anymore. So like that's the last academic literature she'd probably read. So she went back when she was told she had to write a national security strategy. She wrote it based on the stuff <laughs> that she'd learned back in graduate school, right? 50, you know, 25 years earlier. And by the way, this tells you that like, you know, 
the way in which there's a long tail of theoretical effect of any of you know of any successful you know theoretical endeavor, right? And so then you know we invaded Iraq, and we all know that that turned out to be one of the worst catastrophes in so US great. history, right? All good, right? And then my book comes out in 2000 and late 2003, early 2004, just as the insurgency is starting up in Iraq and things are going totally pear-shaped in Iraq. And people read the dissertation or the book at that point, Mandarins of the Future, partly as a kind of intellectual prehistory of the invasion of Iraq. Um, now, it is that, but I wanna just make a very clear point about this. That's not what I intended to be. Obviously, when I was <laughs> when I was thinking of the dissertation, you know, conceiving it and doing the basic work in the late 1990s, I had no idea that 9/11 was going to happen. I had no idea we were going to invade Iraq. I had no idea that these, you know, these ideas. I thought these ideas were dead. I mean, the, the truth was, while there were some, you know, like Francis Fukuyama had come out with the end of history, which was modernization theory, but it had been roundly excoriated, and Samuel Huntington had written the end, had written the clash of civilizations to refute it, and you know, Bob Kaplan had written the coming anarchy, and Laurie Garrett had written, you know, the coming plague, and lots of people had beaten up on Fukuyama. So I thought this stuff was totally dead, and I thought, you know, the owl of Minerva was getting ready to fly on on modernization. <laughs> And that's why I picked the topic. I didn't pick the topic because I thought it was going to come back. I thought I picked the topic because I thought now was the time to historicize this thing that was dead. So mm. I got totally lucky, actually. Wake um, up of a lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> just timing. And this tells you something about the success of any book. Like a lot of a lot of the success yeah. of any book is just, you know, timing, publicity, and so on. And I think part of the reason why people have enjoyed Manners of the Future is because they think that it was a well-timed, you know insertion into an understanding of why the United States invaded Iraq. But as I say, like, that was dumb, blind luck. <laughs> <laughs> Academic publishing oftentimes does not rely on, um, you know, precision, um, you know, publishing and quick turnarounds or anything like that. So right. that's a, a, a misconception. So, um, you know, it's interesting you, you mentioned this about kind of the zombie theory, because, you know, as a medievalist, right, like one of the things that we always have to contend with is like the, the IR theory, like of neo-medievalism, like, like, so there are these echoes which come in, which is this idea of like, this is a medieval state and we need to modern, you know, create the modern. And that actually, since we're, we're over the half hour, leads into one of our audience's question is that Dagmar asked, I think a really good one is like, what are the, when people are talking about modernization theory, these theorists or, or even the kind of the warmed over version of Condoleezza Rice and, and, you know, kind of the architects of the Iraq and Afghanistan war and people like that, what do they mean by modern? Like, how are they defining modern? Well, you know, I think this is another thing that uh, I spent a lot of time thinking about. Um, you know, my, my initial training in intellectual history was actually in European intellectual history. Um, when I was an undergraduate, I, I, my, my primary advisor was uh, Martin Jay, you know, the, the, the historian of the Frankfurt School, but European intellectual history, one of the you know, most important scholars of intellectual, Amer you know, European intellectual history in the United States um, over the last 50 years. Um, and, you know, I, I initially was, you know, working with, with, with Dr. Jay, I, 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 I read a ton about the theory of what modernity was, right, as it had been theorized in the European intellectual tradition. Uh -huh. um, and a lot of the, what I tried to do in this book was to actually take the idea of modernity really seriously in light of the debates about modern, about modernity that come out of, you know, several centuries of post-enlightenment theorizing in the European tradition. Um, and to try to understand what the implicit definition of modernity was that the modernization theorists had embedded in them. And the fact that I had had this background, mainly as an undergraduate, um, in you know, rigorous understandings and theorizations of modernity really, really helped me. Um, and so you know, I, the, I, I read a you know, ton of you know, everything from Kant to Marx, you know, to Hegel to Marx, to the Frankfurt School to, you know, postmodern theory. And like, you know, like a lot of, you know, theory heads in the 1990s, I was really interested in postmodern theory in particular, um, you know, before I came to this dissertation topic. And I think that the uh, kind of snarky attitude I had towards the really under theorized nature of the modern that the modernization theorists had was partly based on the fact that I'd spent a ton of time, you know, thinking and reading about the theory of the modern uh, that the modernization theorists had. 
And actually, I found this amazing document in the archives, in the, in the Rockefeller Foundation archives, where Edward Schills, who was a sociologist at the University of Chicago, who was one of the most important intellectual figures in the development of modernization theory, had written, where he just lays out, you know, in sort of you know, staccato form, uh, modernity is X, Y, Z, and I, I don't have the, the, the text in front of me and I don't want to misquote him, but it's literally the first page of Manners of the Future sets up him delivering the lecture where he gives, the, you know, and he has like 27 elements of what defines a modern state. It's that it has got progressive taxation. It's that, uh -huh. it, it, you know, blah, 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 blah. And part of what you see when you see the staccato list is it's literally him listing out what are the features of the ideal world the ideal state, the ideal society that an American liberal in 1956 believes the society should be. That is how he defined modernity, right? And he yeah. says, everybody is therefore, in the modernization theory therefore implicitly is that the telos of all of history is for the world to end up as the ideal world for 1950s American liberals, right? Mm -hmm. So that's quite an extraordinary yeah. It's quite extraordinarily narcissistic, among other things. Right? Like, you know, that, 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 that everybody in the world is headed towards my ideals. I mean, I'm as narcissistic as the next guy, but I don't think everybody is headed towards where I would like the world to be. So building on that, because a lot of this, you know, the past 40 minutes have been about what Americans and the West and cold warriors have thought, I have to ask a question from Adora, who was in your class with me uh, back in undergrad. So she asked about how other powers, specifically China and the East and maybe the Global South, has engaged with modernization theory, especially since the Cold War has ended. So she asked, you know, what does something like China's belt and, and road sort of fit into modernization theory or does it? Yeah, that's a great question. So first of all, one of the things I'm most proud of is that uh, there is a pirated copy of Manners of the Future in translated into Chinese that is uh, nice. that's floating around on the internet. Um, I, I didn't get one penny of royalty, so they stole it from me, but I'm happy. <laughs> Um, so, uh, and that's not a surprise because the Chinese uh, Communist Party, um, the current regime, um, not so much actually the current regime, um, the Xi regime, but really especially the um, Jiang Zemin and the Hu Jintao regime um, were very interested in modernization uh, as a process. And they were interested in the way in which Americans had thought about the process. So it's not surprising really that my book is an intellectual history of American thinking about this has been, you know, um, you know translated into Chinese. Um, but the Chinese have, uh, I think during the 90s and aughts, very much thought of themselves as trying to have a state-led modernization process. Uh, they talk a lot about modernization. They've been talking about this since the uh, reform and opening up period starting in the late 1970s. Um, you know, Deng Xiaoping would talk about the four modernizations. I'm forgetting what the four are, but you know, he would have different elements of this. And they definitely see themselves as engaged in a process of state-directed, you know, industrialization. That's obviously, you know, one of the hallmarks of the modernization process. Um, and they, they definitely want to see themselves move through a directed process of development in that way. Um, I think things have changed a little bit in the last you know, decade in China. They don't necessarily see themselves as replicating uh, the US path. Um, you know, one of the challenges with modernization theory as a, as a theoretical paradigm, and one of the reasons why it died as a theoretical, an explicit theoretical paradigm in the 1970s is people realize that the one country at a time model of modernization doesn't really make sense in a globalizing world, right? You know, the way in which the United States industrialized is not gonna work for Malawi. Right, um, no matter what, because you know when the United States was industrializing, there was England, but there wasn't a whole world of industrial states already that were going to subordinate you into the WTO. So the opportunities for modernization look very, very different in you know 2021 than they do in uh, you know in 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 1820 when the United States was you know embarking on an industrialization process. Um, so uh, so the Chinese. Have had a very, have have sort of moved away from the model of simply replicating the growth pattern of the West and are now thinking about like how do we and, and the reason why they're moving away from that is that one of the things that happens and this is again one of the ways in which modernization theory has been refuted uh, on a theoretical level is people realize now that many states that embark on a simply replication strategy end up in what's known as a middle income trap you can you can copy up to a certain point 
what other countries have done successfully in terms of you know creating a textile industry at a low wage premium. But like once your people start to want to get paid more, you got to start doing other things and you've got to innovate. And the way in which countries that developed earlier innovated are not going to work now because the technology frontier looks very different in 2021 than it did in 1981 or 1921 or 1821, right? So the ways in which you're going to innovate in order to be able to sustain your development and to move beyond, you know, so it's one thing to move from low income to middle income, but it's a very different thing to move from the middle income to, you know, the technology frontier, right? And in truth, very few countries have actually made that transition successfully in the post-colonial era. I mean, I, I really, you know, the Asian tigers are famous for this, but in terms of large industrialized countries, I would argue that the only country that's really been successful at this is South Korea. And South Korea is a really exceptional case for all sorts of reasons that we could get into in another podcast. Um, yeah. but, uh, but so the Chinese now are engaged in a different kind of strategy. The, the issue that the Chinese face is in order for them to escape from the middle income trap, they're realizing they need to become an innovative society, right? And so this is why they're investing in all sorts of what they refer to as frontier technologies, artificial intelligence, high-speed rail, renewable energy, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Like these are the frontier technologies today, the general purpose technologies, biotechnology would be another example. These are the most important cutting edge general purpose technologies today. And the Chinese realize they need to become you know, the leaders in those fields, if they're going to be able to, you know, bring the country from the current middle income status it has now up to a, you know, you know, upper, uh, a higher income status going forward. So they're really going through a very different process now than they were, you know, 20 years ago, 40 years ago, in terms of thinking about what their development strategy is going to be. So just to ask specifically about the Belt and Road, the Belt and Road is an, is an interesting initiative. I think the Belt and Road is essentially over, actually. The Belt and Road was a specific response to a particular problem that the Chinese had, which was similar to the challenge that the United States had in the 1940s, which is when you're a huge export, you have a huge amount of export surplus, you're bringing in a huge amount of revenue, that's potentially inflationary in your domestic economy. You need to export capital in order to first take off the inflationary pressure at home and second, create markets for your industrializing products at home. So Belt and Road fundamentally was about creating export, you know, getting rid of the inflationary pressure at home by exporting capital, giving it to countries you know, in China's near abroad to be able to buy products from China, from China's industrial base. Now that China's um, trade surplus, net trade surplus has abated, they're exporting a lot less capital because they don't have inflationary pressure associated with that. They've also largely built a lot of the infrastructure that they were planning to. My own view is that a lot of that money is probably going to go to waste. A lot of it was boondoggled projects. It didn't work very well, just like a lot of the infrastructure projects that the United States was sponsoring during those same periods. When you just need to get capital to go out the door, you're not gonna scrutinize very much what the quality of the projects you're approving are. And especially in China where the, the investment decisions are largely decentralized and there's lots of opportunities for graft, you know, a lot of those projects are not gonna turn out well in the long run in my opinion. Um, that kind of that kind of builds on a couple of questions too. Is that somebody asked about um, kind of the role of corruption, which you were talking about, kind of just there within kind of modernization theory and its critiques. But I wanted to ask if it, if it's okay, kind of first is um, because somebody else asked about like like about this. How do you kill a zombie uh, theory, right? Like something that just kind of still and and so you kind of talked a little bit about that. But I'm wondering too, has there been kind of a historical critique? And again, like maybe thinking about this as a medievalist is is a lot of the premises like when as a medievalist when I when I when I read these things sometimes like the historical foundations upon which they're built, the idea of what a developing nation is or a traditional nation is like just it doesn't make any sense to me. Like, so, so has there been that kind of sustained critique or, or that you've seen or? Um, as I say, like there's at, at a theoretical level, there's been a sustained critique. I think people aren't believing it in it anymore. I mean, nobody, there's nobody around today, I don't think with the possible exception of Ronald Englehart who would call themselves a modernization. Right. Sure. Um, so, you know, it, it's a weird thing. It's sort of like neoliberal, right? Who, who calls themselves a neoliberal, right? I mean, there were people who called themselves neoliberals in the 1980s, like, you know, Gary Hart and Bill Clinton, but like, you know, they gave up that label a long time ago. So, you know, I, I don't know that there's really a, 
uh, anybody who's trying to defend the theory. It's one of these things that lingers because as I say, like it appeals implicitly to a certain kind of narcissistic intellectual belief in oneself. Um, now I, I agree with you. Any, you know, part of the issue, the reason why people buy into this idea of traditional societies, even if only implicitly, is because they know nothing about medieval history and the diversity of <laughs> right. They know nothing about you know they know sure. nothing about the diversities of the world. I mean, you know, with uh, you know, there's all the diversity within medieval Europe, but there's also like you know, you know. 17th, other continents and things. Other, yeah. co yeah. other continents, 15th century India, 15th yeah. century China, right? I mean, these are riotously diverse, so-called, you know, uh, you know, not to mention that during that same time period, you know, there's half the world uh, from a geographic perspective is being populated by hunter gatherers still. Um, so, you know, there's, or at least people engaged in only marginal agricultural activity. So, you know, the notion that, that all of that can be lumped into one category is absurd. On its face, but that only that assumes that you know something about that world, which most yeah. people don't. So therefore, like you know, you can make a ridiculously broad generalization, and people who don't know anything don't know any better. Sure, fair enough. So, so you're um, doing, could you could so you talk Matt, a little bit about the corruption? So great, go ahead. Sorry, Matt, you're doing God's work by getting people to understand <laughs> the, the medieval world. Um, you, you can tell my dean that. So <laughs> thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Um, could you talk a little bit about the corruption angle as well, like how that kind of plays into this as well? Yeah, so, you know, well, within modernization theory, as in, the, in, the, in its classical form, um, corruption sort of didn't figure in the equation. Uh, but if we think about the role of corruption in the development process more generally, um, you know, there's a, uh, there's a cliched line, um, uh, about how in Africa, corruption blocks development, but in India, corruption is development. Um, and, 100% uh, true, 100% well, true. There's a, whole, there's a whole bunch of dubious racial stuff there that I don't wanna validate. Um, <laughs> but, what I, but what I would say is this, uh, you know, people who study corruption, now there's a whole field of corruption studies. People talk about a distinction between two different kinds of corruption which are, there's various labels that you put on it. But the way I usually like to think about it is retail corruption versus wholesale corruption. Retail corruption is I'm paying a specific bribe to a particular person because I want to get a project done, right? That kind of corruption actually can facilitate things because it cuts through bureaucratic red tape, right? Like I need to get this, I want to get this bridge built or this road built or this factory, you know, factory approved. And I'm just going to grease the skids a little bit to an underpaid bureaucrat and get the process moving really quickly, right? So that, that actually can be positive. I tend to think of corruption in this sense as being a little bit like filth in your house. There's an optimal level for, for it and it's not zero, right? You don't wanna be a totally OCD neat freak because that actually is not healthy either. Like a little bit of magui as the French say is actually like makes things go around, right? On the other hand, if it gets too bad, like the filth in your house it's disgusting, right? And it actually is terrible. And so once you get to a wholesale corruption where the entire process is being corrupted, it's not that there's a specific thing that needs to be, the grease needs to be, the skids need to be greased, but instead you're like, oh, we're gonna like steal all the oil revenues in Nigeria, right? That's obviously not good for uh, the development of the country. And there's no bright line between those things. And one thing may bleed over into the other. Yeah. One thing may lead to the other. Um, and, you know, as with, you know, we've all experienced this with our house, you know, you go, you, you stop cleaning your house and all of a sudden it goes from being just kind of acceptably messy. And then all of a sudden it's like totally out of control. You got to do a wholesale clean. Right. So, you know, I, I tend to think of corruption in those terms. Um, development in general requires a certain level of like, you know, getting things done. Now, if we go back to China, of course, this is a really interesting issue. Like the, part of the reason why Xi Jinping got support in his bid for his uh, premiership in China is that he promised to take on corruption. China during the 1990s and aughts was a highly corrupt place. And some of it was retail, a lot of it was retail corruption. Some of it was wholesale corruption. And it was as the Chinese upper echelons, upper cadres started to see that it was slipping from retail to wholesale corruption that they realized they needed to do something about it because yeah. as they, you know, they didn't want to become Nigeria, 
right? And so, you know, the, the, the mandate that Xi Jinping came in with was stop corruption. The problem is that everybody who made it rich in China in the 90s and aughts was engaged in at least retail corruption, if not borderline or extreme wholesale corruption, right? And mm. so everybody in the elite is potentially vulnerable to a retrospective prosecution for corruption, right? And of course, there's no ex post facto grandparenting yeah. and exceptions in a country like China, which doesn't have the rule of law. Um, you know, they're gonna, if they wanna go after people. And so everybody's sort of in a, in a state of, you know, fear that they could be taken down. All the elites that have made money during the last 30 years of Chinese development are all in a state of fear that they could be taken out and they absolutely could be. And the result is this is a way of enforcing discipline with respect to uh, you know, the power. But you know, of course, it also leads to an arbitrariness. Some people are being prosecuted and other people aren't. And who gets prosecuted and who doesn't depends on actually who they're connected to, which is its own form of corruption. Interesting. Okay, so one of the questions that I had, which uh, is part of some of the questions that the that uh, the audience has, is how do you categorize deviant globalization? Because while modernization theory is like growing, you know, it's one of the one of the terms that everybody's interested in from the 1950s to sort of now. Globalization is also a major term that sort of you know takes. It used to be interdependence, and now it's globalization. And you and you know a bunch of people that you know sort of come up with the term of deviant globalization. How do you characterize that? Why is it deviant? Right, so, um, so deviant globalization basically refers empirically to the global flows of not goods, but what you might call bads. So arms smuggling, drug dealing, sex trafficking, antiquity smuggling, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You know, kidney, kidney dealing, anything that is considered a, uh, a, a, a trade that should be banned for moral reasons, all right, is something that I would put into the category and, and that's being traded globally is something I would put in the category of deviant globalization. Why does deviant globalization exist? Uh, the reason why deviant globalization exists is because we have a globalized economy um, and there are uneven regulatory and moral considerations in different parts of the world. So let's just take the issue of sex tourism. Why does sex tourism exist? Sex tourism exists because some pe people in one place want to have sex a certain way that's banned in their or morally frowned upon in their jurisdiction where they live. And it's considered acceptable in the place where they could travel on vacation, right? That's why, you know, so you get a moral gradient and that allows you to have a, you know, uh, an arbitrage opportunity. Now, ar the term arbitrage um, comes out of the finance industry when you have prices for two different things that are different in two different jurisdictions. So the price of gold in the Tokyo market is you know, $1,717 and the price of gold in the London market is $1,697. If you just trade back and forth between them, you can get them to equalize at $1,707. Deviant globalization involves something different, which is you have moral differences between and or mm -hmm. enforcement differences between different jurisdictions. And those are more sustainable, right? Because people are willing to enforce a moral regulation even when there's a price premium, right? So what you end up getting is a situation where if there's a moral opprobrium, for example, in the United States against selling and taking cocaine, right? But there's not a moral opprobrium against producing cocaine in the valleys of Peru or of processing cocaine in the jungles of Colombia or of shipping cocaine through Mexico, now there's a business opportunity for people, right? And the more that the US government tries to enforce the prohibition against cocaine in the United States, the more they raise the price premium that the people who are producing and, uh, and shipping cocaine get. And so, oh my God, I'm sorry. I need to turn off my thing background here. One second. <laughs> sources. Pardon me. Um, so, so deviant globalization consists of the process of uneven f the flow of bads between different jurisdictions on the basis of different moral and or enforcement capacities in different jurisdictions. So the reason I became interested in that is that modernization theory posed that development happens in one country, 
One of the critiques of modernization theory was, oh, actually development happens on a global basis and it's globalization. And then I said, actually globalization has this other problem, which is that there's all these bad things that flow because we still have national jurisdictions that are setting different kinds of moral and regulatory standards. And that creates its own arbitrage opportunities that aren't just about wages between you know, Bangladeshi garment you know, workers and you know, garment workers yeah. in North Carolina. It's about moral differences and whereas price differences are arbitraged away, moral differences are not. But can they be? Like, I mean, is there is there is there a process by which those those can be normalized? I think it's hard. I think it's really hard. I mean, you know, cultural values around what's considered acceptable behavior, those are really, you know, to put it in economics terms, those are really sticky. Sure. People, yeah. Cultural values change. You know, just because somebody else thinks it's okay for you to sleep with 16 year olds when you're on vacation in, you know, in Philippines, doesn't mean people want to accept that here on the streets in the United States. I mean, just look at, you know, Matt, Matt Gates, you know, eh. yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so the last question that I have, or one of the questions that I have is a selfish question, but it is also from the audience question. So uh, Howard asked, does the, do the modernization theorists, you know, half a century ago, or even, you know, Waltman Rostow in the 19th 90s, do they consider the issues that environmentalists today highlight? Because as you know, mm -hmm. I look at dams and how environmentalists react to dams. So does, how does modernization theory sort of affect how environmentalists today are sort of talking about issues and development? Yeah, there, there, there's two answers to that question. So first of all, classical modernization theory paid no attention to environmental issues. Uh, the classic you know, starting point for the modern environmental movement in the United States is um, uh, Rachel Carson. 1970s. Carson's. Uh, yeah. Well, specifically Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, which I think is published in 62, is really the beginning yeah. of it, but then it really takes off in the 1970s. And actually the environmental critique of the, moder the modernization theory style of development is one of the things that undermines modernization theory, right? Now, so that's, that's one story is that they didn't pay attention to it. And the fact that they didn't pay attention to it was one of the you know, talking points against them as the, as the theory fell apart in the 1970s. However, there is a movement um, that has really taken off over the last 20 years called the eco-modernist movement um, that has tried to make an argument um, associated with the idea that there is this modernization story that like, you know, one of the stories of modernization theory was that there's a so-called Kuznets curve named after the, um, the uh, I'm in Kuznets. I'm Kuznets who argued that like, the, you know, initially impoverished countries, traditional countries are pretty equal because everybody's poor. Then as you modernize and industrialize, you start to get a rich class and you start to get growing inequality. And then he observed with presentist bias, you start as the country becomes actually modern, you start to get a recompression of inequality in as welfare states are built out. And so Kuznets argued that like initially there's you know, low levels of inequality, then it goes, sorry, then it goes high, and then it goes back down low again in terms of inequality, because he was writing from the point of view of 1955 when there was relatively low inequality, right? So people have argued the same thing about, about environmental issues, right? Which is that people start out with, you know, um, you know, disconcern for environmental issues. Then as the environmental issues get worse because of industrialization, people start to get concerned. Then as they get rich, they start to insist that we are gonna take care of the environmental issues. And then eventually uh, the environmental issues get better. And again, that's a present story, right? You think about the United States, pollution in the 1960s was terrible. The environmental movement comes along in the 70s, environmental pollution goes way down, mainly because we ship our environmental pollution abroad. Um, as we deindustrialize our own economy, we ship it to China. We buy all of our you know, toys from China so that they're having their toxic waste in China, but we're still able to consume our things here and we have a nice clean environment for the most part in coastal California. Um, so some people have argued that there's a similar Kuznets cur environmental Kuznets curve and eco-modernists tend to believe that there's a story around that. As you can tell, I have my skepticism for the same reasons I had my skepticism <laughs> about the original version of it. Yeah. Okay, so last question. I'm really sorry, Matt. I know it's 5 p.m., but Kevin, who was also in our class uh, back in 2012. We've got the back together so this is, I know this I know, is like a reunion. It's, back together. it's yeah. because they all follow me on Twitter. Okay, so Kevin <laughs> asks, uh, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm embellishing this question a little bit, but how did you uh, get from studying modernization theory in grad school and college 
to now studying, you know, transnational crime and deviant globalization at a think tank. How did you end up at a think tank? Um, so first of all, I don't study transnational crime at a think tank. Uh, I was studying transnational crime as when I was in a management consultant in an earlier phase of my career about 10 years ago. Um, and that's because a lot of my clients were in law enforcement and, uh, you know, intelligence agencies that were interested in understanding why they never win the war on drugs. Um, <laughs> And um, so that's, that's sort of how I got into that topic, you know, 13, 14 years ago now. Um, what we do at my, you know, how did I get into the think tank world? You know, uh, there's not a straightforward answer. I think most of the people who spend time in think tanks, they mostly have graduate degrees. Um, sometimes it's, it's an MA in public policy, but a lot of them are PhDs. Uh, most of them have practitioner backgrounds though. Um, and that's part of the story about how I got to my current job at the Bagruen Institute is that my previous job, as you mentioned at the top of the hour, Varsha, was as the Associate Chancellor um, at, at UC Berkeley. And so I had ex, you know, experience you know, working in a complicated bureaucracy on high-level public policy issues. I also had practitioner experience you know, working in uh, policy issues in my consulting days. And so that sort of you know, meant that I had some experience that allowed me to you know, both figure out how to develop programs. I mean, my job at the Bagruen Institute is partly to be, you know, public intellectual, but also actually more, I spend more time on actually building out the institutional infrastructure as we're trying to turn ourselves into a sort of going concern. And having had experience building, um, building research infrastructures, that's what really gave me the opportunity to do this. Okay. That's great, a success story. So, which we don't have a, a lot of with, with, yes, with, uh, with PhDs sometimes, so. Yeah, yeah okay. Does. It'll be a different conversation, but I actually think it's mostly luck. I mean, I really do believe that most <laughs> are, are, are dumb luck. Yeah. You're very lucky I did not ask you about the recent discussion online and, in, you know, the ether about the academic situation right now, because that is a whole other story. I, I have I a lot, uh, lot of opinions about that, Varsha. We should do a whole other episode on that. <laughs> whole other episode on how to basically, you know, at the current university system in order to make sure I, that- I, I have an op-ed right. that's going to be appearing possibly on my Substack or possibly in a better place, possibly in a better place, if not on my Substack, <laughs> um, shortly where I'm going to propose a modest proposal in the Jonathan Swift sense for what needs to be done. Yes, do it. I, I think- one of the best things about, you know, following Mills on Twitter, if you don't follow Mills on Twitter, is that he is, you know, basically no holes barred on the fact that the current situation in academia is perhaps not just unforgivable, but un unfixable, right? There's a lot of grad students across the world who insist that, you know, they're joining grad schools maybe to do stuff beyond academia. But really what they're hoping for is that one, you know, amazing tenured position, but they're not going to get it, right? So I think... That's one of the reasons that, you know, modernization theory sort of like appealed to me as a dissertation topic is because you think you're going to get some amazing utopia, but you know from the beginning that's, that's never going to happen. Well, can I just, can I just, can I just yeah. close on one term since I imagine that many of your listeners may be graduate students? Yeah. I want to, I want to, um, I want to just say one thing, like uh, many of you are probably familiar with the, Hitler's concept of the big lie, a lie that's so big. <laughs> Ages that everybody is like, oh my God, I can't believe you would lie like that. Like that, that, that's super impressive. The big lie of academia in that Hitler sense is that you can only have an intellectually rewarding life inside of academia. Um, it's absolutely not true. I, and I, I can tell you that from personal experience. Now, to some extent you have to engage in what ecologists call niche construction. You have to like build your own world for yourself. And so you have to be entrepreneurial, but like I've worked in software, I've worked in management consulting firms, I've worked in academic administration, now I'm working at a think tank. I've done a lot of different things. There's a lot of people who are interested in intellectual things out in the world and that you can make your world when you get there, if you're willing to put in the effort. You don't have to think that like, if you leave graduate school, you leave the academic world, that you're gonna you know, enter you know, the Sahara Desert of intellectualism. It's just not true, it's a lie. And you can have a perfectly great life. Now, I'm not trying to denigrate. Look, if you can get a job, an, a, a tenure track job at a good university or even, you know, even at a mediocre university. Um, I've got lots of family members who are academics from, you know, the most high prestige universities to the least prestigious universities. 
And there's great lives to be had there. But there's also great lives to be had outside the academy. And I mean great lives intellectually, not just in terms of material stuff. Well, that, I think maybe, that's the best part. Yeah. I mean, maybe, and maybe that's, that's the best place to end, right? Is, is on this kind of hopeful, thoughtful note. So, um, so let me, on behalf of, of Drinking With The Stories, thank you, Nils, for, for joining us. I mean, it's been a wonderful conversation. Um, we'll be back in a couple of weeks um, with Roxanne Panchazi, who will be talking about uh, French, modern French history, um, uh, nuclear um, concerns, Algeria, all sorts of really interesting stuff. Uh, look for information about that soon. Uh, and uh, Rachel just put into the chat uh, Nils's Substack, so go check that out immediately afterwards. But until then, let me say thank you again, Nils, and to everybody, cheers. Cheers. Thanks so much, Nils.